Welcome to Ideation Collective. I'm Jess Larson. Today on the show, I've got Grant Cazada. He's a sniper from Army Rangers, but he's also a business owner. Come in and, and it's they want to spend more money and they, they, they want to look their best, whereas in the past, they might not have cared about a quality haircut. A $10 haircut would have been fine, but now they're like, hey, I'll spend $60 on a haircut and a shave, you know, like once a week or once a month. This is another episode of Innovation and Leadership where we interview all kinds of high achievers from world-class musicians to CEOs, authors, and pro athletes. Try to find the common elements of success no matter what you're working on. We've got a new book coming out soon. If you want to get an advanced copy for free, please email me, jess at innovationandleadership.com and just tell me in the email. Again, jess, J-E-S-S, at innovationandleadership.com. And now onto the episode. Grant, thanks for making time. Hey, thanks, Jess. I appreciate it, bud. So let's start with uh, let's start with your business. Tell us about John Hancock. So uh, I got out of the army about just about two years ago and uh, moved back to my hometown of Prescott, Arizona. And uh, I kind of did not know exactly what I was going to be doing um, before I went into the army. I, I cut hair for a couple of years, and so upon returning, I kind of looked at the uh, the area of where I was moving back to, and, and the entire Tri City area is about 160,000 people. And uh, they had a total of like nine barber shops. So I realized that uh, I think I could create a brand and an image and brand this idea of what I had and, and pretty much open up multiple shops uh, throughout the area and then kind of keep expanding into northern Arizona. Um, you know, largely due to the fact that all the barber schools are down in Phoenix or the Valley, which is about two hours south. Uh, there's really nobody that can carry on any type of legacy when it comes to barbering up in the northern part of Arizona. And so uh, that was the goal. So after um, being out about two months and moving moving back here with my wife and kids, uh, I bought a barber shop that was going out of business and then invited a buddy of mine out from uh, – Midwest about a month and a half later, and we grew the shop relatively very quickly. Within about a, a year and a half, I now have two shops and eight employees, and um, we, we're growing right now at a rate of about uh, 10 to 12 percent a month, which um, which is pretty pretty good, and it's it's staying consistent, and it really is just going to keep keep growing as long as everything is done correctly. <laughs> Well, there's some things about this I, I definitely want to talk about here later in the episode. Um, I feel like you guys have really tapped into, there's almost kind of like this whole movement towards like manvertising, you know, with tattoos yep. and beards and beard oil and <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and you guys, uh, you know, you guys definitely have some, some, uh, differentiation from your average barbershop as far as the way you entertain, <laughs> the way you guys entertain, uh, having guys come in and hang out and hand them a cigar and this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we have um, gentlemen can come in and we just have a complimentary you know, like whiskey or beer, obviously soft drinks if they want something. We have cigars um, at my downtown location. I have a full size shuffleboard table, a couple flat screen TVs, uh, dartboard, chess table. So just little things to where guys can. And that's like an upstairs hangout lounge above the barbers. So it creates an atmosphere to where guys can kind of um, come in, relax and engage other men in conversation uh, if if they want to, where, whereas, especially in today's society, most of that, if, if it's going down, it's going to be in a work type of environment, um, or it's going to be, you know, really at like a bar or a restaurant, which is, you know, not always the best place. So barbershops traditionally have been a place of kind of, um, you know, just masculinity kind of wrapped up in that whole package and the ability for men to kind of just come in and relax and shoot the breeze, uh, converse and kind of get things off their chest. And so, it's been a really um, positive influence within the culture already here in Prescott. And, uh, you know, I get feedback all the time from random people I don't even know, but they're like, oh, you own John Han Hancock? Like, man, I always hear about it or I come in and I see so-and-so or, you know, so we've like opened up on the weekends to where guys come in and they can watch football games. Or the other day we hosted the debates here at the downtown location. I had about 25 dudes come down and we just watched the debates. And so, you know, really trying to be more of a, um, well, it's, it's interesting, you know, as you and I've got to know each other and, and you've helped out with the child rescue stuff and these different things. Um, you know, at first when I heard about what you're doing, I'm like envisioning like, you know, strip mall haircut place, right? Like yep. this is what this, and like my, certainly my experience growing up was haircut is this, like, it's like a commodity, you know what I mean? Yep. 
Um, and so to, to me to hear about like 10% growth per month, not per year, right? Um, yeah. I think it's a testament to this as much as you're sell as much as you're selling haircuts, like you're selling an experience. You're like, I, I go through your Instagram and I can see like the smile on these, on these dudes faces <laughs> after coming to the barber shop. It's almost like, uh, some sort of like self-identifying thing of like, I'm the kind of guy who goes to a barber shop like this is kind of like the, it seems like that's the feeling there that gets instilled. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as, as just, uh, men and as people, everybody wants to be kind of wrapped up in, um, in being a part of something bigger than themselves. And so from the very beginning, it was very apparent that if, if I continue to grow this brand, um, I need to disassociate myself and my buddy Damien, who started with me, uh, you know, like a, a month and a half after I got this space. But um, I need to disassociate ourselves with the brand to where people come in and they don't know who I actually am. You know, they're not coming in and they, they see Grant as the owner. It's just Oh, that dude cuts hair. And then if they find out they do, but who cares, you know, and really it comes down to the customer, the client and, you know, appeasing them and appealing to like the senses. So, um, especially in today's society, so much of how we live our lives as consumers is very experiential and we want to, uh, get out there and experience and have a part in, in what we're doing with and where our money's going to. And so, um, that was kind of the business model is how do I, how do I create something to where guys want to come in and, and it's, they want to spend more money and they, they, they want to look their best. Whereas in the past, they might not have cared about a quality haircut, a $10 haircut would have been fine. But now they're like, Hey, I'll spend $60 on a haircut and a shave, you know, like once a week or once a month or, you know, buying, <clears throat> buying products and really getting behind the brand of, of what it is. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been pretty cool to see, see happen and be a part of that. Well, and we're going to talk more about this where you really crossed from, from, you know, self-employed trading hours for dollars to this idea of a system that can work when you're not there because having, having multiple locations means by definition, you're not there. There's yeah. somewhere that you're not right. Um, yeah. but let, let's talk about the other side, you know, um, ideation collective, we've got these other businesses, we've got our, our arm that does the video production. We've got our consulting arm, Mylan advisors, um, really on the training side of things. And, you know, for you, eight years at, and second battalion with the Rangers before getting out and coming to uh, the guard where you are now, nine deployments between Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, when you think about specifically um, the, the sniper side of things, uh, there's a lot of people that, that really have a lot of respect for that, um, but not everybody can, d can do it. Um, when you think about the difference between just showing up and pulling the trigger versus the kind of purposeful repetitions that, that help guys qualify. I mean, look at you, you're going to the international sniper competition next week. Um, you got, you obviously placed top three at Winston to be able to get into the international sniper competition, but, um, and we'll talk about that, but can you talk about this idea of the kind of repetitions, the kind of practice that it takes? So from a, just a very early stage of, uh, I guess, being a baby sniper, as we call it, but um, y you're taught everything is just uh, consistency and being repetitive and um, consistency is key with everything. So when it comes down to laying behind the gun every single time, making sure your cheek is sitting on the buttstock the same way every single time, making sure that you're always adjusting the parallax on the side of the scope before every shot, making sure your hand is gripped the same way, your trigger finger is gripped the same way, your breathing is the same. Um, so by, by being consistent, when you actually squeeze that trigger and the round is sent down range, if you happen to miss the target, which happens often, um, now you're looking down range and you can reevaluate and reassess in microseconds. What did I do different, you know, and why did I not hit that target? You know? Um, so obviously you can take into account for, okay, there was a wind, a left to right wind or something or a right to left. And I judged it at maybe five miles an hour and it was seven and it blew, you know, two tenths of a mil off the right hand side or something. Um, or you can very easily reevaluate and say, no, OK, I did everything right. And right before I squeezed the trigger, I remembered I kind of squeezed it on the left side of my trigger finger and that pushed the bullet right or something along those lines. So the more consistent you are and the more um, just the more time spent behind the weapon system, uh, it, it breeds familiarity with with yourself, with how you're ingraining all of that training into um, actually producing what you're trying to do downrange. 
so it's it, kind of all that stuff is how I'm trying to roll it over into the uh, to the business aspect of of my barber shops and like really getting down to the brass tacks of like okay where can we get more efficient and better at literally every single angle you know because at the end of the day I'm like I'm selling a haircut and experience but how do we how do we uh, maintain quality control well it's probably like sending out emails with the ten questions on specifically like hey were you greeted at the front door was the shop clean uh, and providing set questions and answers so people can answer very quickly and efficiently and they're not having to look for answers themselves but we kind of provide the answers for them and then on top of that just um, quality control when it comes down to like the barbers are checking each other's haircuts like once a day and that way it, it kind of keeps all of us on our toes of kind of um, oh my work is actually going to get checked by somebody else you know like I thought I was doing the right thing and maybe I was I was wrong in this certain angle I was holding the hair or this clipper cut or that or this. Yeah. So, I mean, it keeps people humble and, and, um, it keeps an atmosphere of like, we can consistently grow and learn from each other. And we're not just doing something by ourselves the entire time, all day for months and years. And you've just ingrained bad habits, you know? So same thing with getting behind a long gun by, by having your buddies either spot for you or, or just simply listening and, and seeing how other people do things. Um, you know, we can always be learners and there's, there's nothing that there's nothing in this world where we just walk in and we think we know everything. And, and I don't think I'll ever get to that level of shooting ever. You can always learn something. So sure. Well, when you think about, um, hours into it, when paying that close of attention, uh, when people don't feel like it anymore, you know, it takes some willpower to like continually work hard at it. Um, do you, are there any tricks you tell yourself or are, are there, are there habits you saw in guys who didn't end up making it that you feel like, you know, Hey, this is probably the reason that they weren't able to, to make it to those higher levels within the, the sniper groups. Yeah. I would, I think probably the, one of the biggest things is that, um, men just don't become passionate about what they're doing. So I came over and from the time I was a young kid before I went into the military, I always wanted to be a sniper and do the special operations thing. And so for me, when I got into the platoon, I spent five years at 2nd Range of Battalion as a sniper. Um, before, before that, I was on the line for eight years and doing that stuff. But um, it, became, uh, it became something that I associated a little bit of my identity with. And I say that because... Um, the flip side of that is you can associate so much of your identity with one thing that it becomes who you are. And then when you get out, um, you know, you have a problem with like, who am I? And you're kind of searching for your self-worth and all that stuff. So I was very apparent, you know, throughout my entire military career that like, look, this is what I do. I love what I do. This is, um, my duty and my job, but I'm not going to let it, uh, dictate who I am as, as an individual. So, but when it came to being a sniper, same thing, like you, the problem that I saw a lot between the guys that couldn't hack it and the guys that were really good was the guys that were really good became very like passionate about it and they would go out and spend their own money to buy their own weapon systems and shoot in their off time and then you had guys that might be in the sniper section for two or three years and you know you you realize like man you've never owned like you don't own any bolt guns you don't own any sniper rifle like gas gun systems you don't, you know, it's just something for them. It's like, you know, whatever. It's a nine to five job. Um, I got so many, so much other stuff on my plate. Like, I'm not going to shoot on my off time. But for me, it became um, something I was passionate about. And when I got out, I pursued it even more. And I, I shoot competitively on the civilian side. And so I have, you know, different bolt guns that I have and different gas guns and, um, you know, seeking out sponsorships for different um, shooting venues and, and other individuals that are, that, um, are well along in their years past me that, that have been doing this a lot longer, you know? So yeah. it's just, I've maintained a level of proficiency and consistency just because I actively want to be better and not necessarily like the best, but just, I want to see myself you know, consistently grow and, and be better and more proficient at what I do. And that, of course, helps um, with me being in the Arizona National Guard. I can help, you know, transmit or push a lot of that information to my younger guys that uh, didn't really necessarily ever get the opportunity to spend time in special operations. And, you know, for them, they're just doing this one week a month or all of us are now. So it's, it's hard to um, maintain that level of proficiency and, and uh, remember a lot of this 
just a extremely important information that you have to you have to kind of keep on hands yeah. if you want to be good at this job. So well, and when you think about and again thinking about it in terms of lessons that could be applied to to anything, to a sport, to somebody's business, to you know a technology, maybe somebody's inventing so they can start a business, right? Um, I think one of the things uh, that I have, you know, as as you and I have got to know each other, um, you do have a real attention for detail, and my guess is that you're not just rushing through things that you are like, you're not just seeing it go by, like you're intentionally observing. And my guess is thinking, how should I adjust according to what just happened? Am I, am I putting words in your mouth there? Or do you think that is how you approach it? No, no, I think, um, yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. I, I, if you were to ask my wife or any of my friends, but specifically my wife, she would say that there's pretty much like nothing that ruffles my feathers, you know? So I'm always, even keel doesn't matter kind of what happens um always laid back and just kind of watching and seeing what's going on and then it's kind of like okay i can react to this you know there's definitely times to be proactive but a lot of times in our life uh life is lived reactionary you know so you can be proactive but as soon as something happens you have to react to it and act quickly and then kind of come up with a new game plan and move on from there so um that's kind of how I approach business and, uh, you know, some of my, my military experience as well. It's like, I'm going to go with a game plan with ex expectations that stuff is going to change. And when it does no big deal, there's no reason to, you know, freak out about it because, um, I'm confident in like my problem solving abilities that it will get fixed very quickly, you know? And for me doing the barbershop thing, um, if I wasn't continually trying to grow and have multiple shops and multi, you know, multi-site locations and run employees and, and manage all this stuff, I think I would have got out a long time ago. I don't think I really would have been doing this. And pretty much the big drive for me staying in this industry is simply all the, <clears throat> you know, like the um, attention to detail and having to multi-site manage and problem solve and all these tools that I, I believe I picked up kind of from the military and now I'm able to like transfer it over to the civilian sector, being, uh, you know, an employer and a business owner um, and, you know, just just transfer that stuff over. So, yeah, it helps out tremendously. Well, you know, I have huge respect for the stuff that you've done and, and what you've learned. Obviously, um, you look at our our training consulting firm at Milan Advisors. We've got, you know, former <laughs> former Rangers who ended up going to the special mission unit guys. Um, who are now working for us out there training. And I think about, um, there's a big advantage I feel like I, I didn't know, you know, before when I used to work at, for somebody else's consulting firm and I was out um, as the director of their special operations command uh, practice, you know, teaching leadership classes to, to folks, whether it's Naval Special Warfare or the SF side of these things, right? Um, I feel like there's a level of, of duty that the rest of corporate America can benefit from. I, I feel like I really benefited from is this, there is kind of this attitude um, where I, I'd hang out these guys and they're, we're talking about football or we're talking about our kids or whatever. And it's, it's so just like any other backyard barbecue kind of conversation I'd have. But then there's this other attitude that I feel like, especially in the soft community, there's this thing about, it's about results. It's about um, taking care of what needs to get done. It's not about me. Um, can you talk about any benefit you feel like that's been to your life or, or, you know, being able to spend years with guys who have this attitude of like, it's not hypothetically, I'm willing to die for this. Like I'm literally willing to die for the rest of you guys kind of selflessness. Yeah. So, uh, I completely agree with that on, on every aspect militarily, but <clears throat> simply because I'm not there anymore when it comes to active duty and being in that environment, um, uh, nothing to talk about other than I, I that's exactly how you feel when you're there. Now, kind of related to the business side of it, um, so I have eight employees and dealing with eight different individuals is eight different problems and, and everything somehow becomes my responsibility, which, <laughs> yeah. I'm, which I'm fine with. But there was recently a, a pretty big issue between a couple barbers and and uh, another buddy who works here. He was like, dude, I would fire you know, like two or three of these guys. And I, I kind of took the approach of like, you know what, I'm not going to fire him. There's no reason to like, um, everything I believe can be talked, you know, talked about and, and come to a resolution that should be able to fix the problem. And I feel like, like you were saying earlier that the, uh, the seal you were telling about that had the story with it, it was his problem. Well, same thing. It was like, 
I can I can fire these two or three individuals and go about looking for um, different guys and reinvest in them, or I can invest continually into the guys I have and <clears throat> and make them feel a part of the team and make them feel like I'm not going to quit on you guys. And so you're not going to quit on yourselves. You know, like these little issues can be fixed and addressed and you guys just need to deal with each other and learn how to like better communicate and these other issues. But by simply approaching it from an aspect of like, well, I'm not going to quit on my employees because I think all too much and I've never worked in corporate America, but I think it's probably too easy to just fire people over issues instead of actually helping individuals become better um, within their life and within their career and and whatever they're doing. You know, that takes more time to invest and it takes um, possibly the emotional drain of like having to just discuss and talk about people, you know, talk about certain issues with people. And a lot of times um, I don't feel like employers are good at doing that. They, uh, they kind of just want these cogs in the wheel that will make their businesses run, but they're not really willing to invest um, emotionally or um, in, in other people's lives. And the reality is we all have to deal with people. So might as well get good at managing and dealing with people and actually helping people out when it comes to them needing help. Um, I look at myself as being an employer and having eight employees and it's like, man, what a blessing that I can actually invest in other people's lives and help them provide for their families and help them provide for themselves instead of just like, how are they going to make me, you know, a hundred thousand dollars this year or $150,000. Isn't it interesting though, how that attitude makes your life better too. Like this, this idea of set of like dwelling on how, how inconvenient it is for us as the owners or the, the leaders that they're, that they haven't, you know, built that internal capability yet, that internal skill set to handle that. Sure. You know, that can be a drag if we, if we are focused on how inconvenient it is for us. But, um, I'm just, I'm guessing here, but, um, my guess is that it actually makes your life better to have been of that kind of service and to help people kind of become a better version of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, the ability to just invest in people's lives is, is key. And I would much rather do that than just like, uh, um, toss guys aside. Yeah. Well, listen, I feel like this is a good place to pull off for part one. Everybody tune into our next episode with Grant. We're going to talk more about being a sniper, being a business owner and the lessons that cross over both directions. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for the show. I hope you liked it. Again, please check out the conference Reed and his team have helped build called productpowerup.com. It's happening uh, this coming Thursday with founder of Stance Socks, Code Epoxy CEO, David Smith, one of the Harmon brothers. And uh, as before, if you're interested in getting on the list to get an advanced copy of our new book coming out, uh, just email me, jess at innovationandleadership.com. Again, J-E-S-S at innovationandleadership.com and just let me know. Thanks so much for listening.